I mentioned in the earlier service that I'm not sure who agreed to let me preach my last Sunday among you, but it was a terrible idea. I did make it till the end of the first service until I started weeping, but apologies in advance. I'm not sure if I'll make it all the way through my sermon today. So when I was a child, we lived in a small Midwestern neighborhood, and there were kids everywhere. So what that meant for summertime was that we got to play outside all day. It was different than a Houston summer, and so you could actually breathe outside in the middle of July. And so we would, from from the beginning of the morning all the way until evening, run around playing dress up and make believe and soccer and sometimes tag, and it was glorious. But we knew the end of the time had come when dad would whistle throughout the neighborhood. He would whistle when he got home from work and shout, dinner, and we knew we had less than five minutes to make it to the front porch or we were going to be in trouble. You did not want to have to make dad come and find you. You better respond to that voice and that whistle. We know the voices of the ones we love. We know the voice of our beloved, of our parents or our caregivers, of our children, those friends that we have spent hours talking to. When we have spent time with someone and grow to love them, we know their voice. I believe that God wants us to know his voice with that same intimacy and familiarity that we have with a parent. I believe that God is always speaking, that God is always on the move, and therefore, we have the opportunity to listen. So as we conclude our series on prayer today, I want to highlight three parts of the verses that we read earlier. There are actually seven distinct theological points, but you can breathe easy. We are not going to do all seven. I've decided to focus on the three that I believe are most tied to the practice of prayer. We're going to look at what Paul means or possibly means when he says pray continually. We're going to consider what it means when he says do not quench the spirit. And then finally, we're going to talk a bit about discernment and testing how we know something is from the Lord. So first, praying continually. When I first read this command, I immediately feel discouraged because I think, how could we possibly pray at all times? How is it that I could possibly keep this scripture as true in my life? The church has tried many different ways to live out this verse throughout the past history. And one of those ways is that I I read about a theologian who talks about prayer as being connected to our very breath so that our bodies have actually been designed that there's this constant prayer that's happening within us. Uh, Some people in different traditions practice what is called the liturgy the liturgy of the hours or the divine office, which is where people will pray at set hours throughout the day, usually in three, three hours apart. And this is one way that the community says that they are centered on prayer continually. The monastic tradition talks about how your work can become your prayer. And so the way that you're actually using your hands and going about your day can become prayer. But I wonder if Paul is talking about something even deeper. I wonder if Paul is not saying, add something else to your to-do list or make sure that prayer gets added to your to-do list throughout the day. So much as he is saying, let prayer shape who you are. Let prayer be not something you do, but something that you embody, the way that you engage every activity and every relationship throughout your life. I think that prayer is something that Paul is saying becomes a part of who you are, not just something that you do from time to time. I think there's evidence that we as people are created to be fully integrated in this way. And so I want to make the comparison between what it looks like sometimes to be a disciple of Jesus with what it means to be a fan of our favorite sports team. I hear that it is baseball season. Is this correct? So I should have really worn an Astros t-shirt. But 
so it, it is Astros season. So if we think about this, when we are a fan of a team, if you're an Astros fan, this probably shapes how you spend some of your time. Most, hopefully your time after work, but sometimes it can interrupt time at work. It might influence your money, how you choose to spend time in your free time. It might shape who you're friends with. You typically want to go to a game with someone else who shares that same interest. And if you're traveling and you're in a different city and you see someone in Astros gear, and this happens to me and I'm a nominal fan at best, when I see someone in Astros gear outside of Houston, I immediately get excited because I think they must love Houston as much as I do. It creates this bond that we share with other people who love the same thing that we love. And when you're an Astros fan and someone asks you, you don't say, yes, I watch the Astros. You say, I am an Astros fan. Because when you love something, it becomes a part of your identity. It shapes how you pay attention and how you use every bit of your resources. And I think this gets closer to what Paul is encouraging us to engage prayer like. He is saying, let your love relationship with God be so overflowing that prayer just happens constantly. That when you're preparing to have a conversation or meet a friend for lunch, you're not just thinking, I want to go have time, spend time with someone I love, but you instead, you let yourself pray for that person. And you ask God, you say, God, show me what you're up to in this person's life so that I can come alongside and support that growth. When you're planning family time, you might ask God, God, you have a plan for my family. How is it that you want to accomplish your purposes in my family? And you lay that before God. It means that even when you go to work, on the days when it's frustrating and you wish you didn't have to go, you're saying, God, I know that you have me here for a purpose, so let me see, open my eyes, that I can engage every single coworker, even and especially the difficult ones, with your grace and love this day. That when we engage prayer in this way, it saturates every part of who we are. I think the other really important part of praying continually that we forget so easily, especially in the context of the church, is the listening side. And pastors, I confess, we're the worst offenders of this. When we write prayer in the bulletin, that means one of us is going to be talking. And so often we begin to be formed to believe that prayer always means we are doing the talking, we are sharing our concerns with God but that listening is as equally, if not more important when we think about prayer. That creating space for God to speak back to us is essential for a robust prayer life. And I heard one pastor giving a sermon on this text compared prayer to a conversation with a friend. And if you had a friend who every time you got together for lunch, they did all of the talking, how deep do you think that relationship would be? Of course that would stall the relationship. And so the same thing is true for our relationship with God, that when we limit prayer to us doing all of the speaking, we are not able to journey as deeply with God because we're not creating space for God to speak to us. And this leads us to the second verse that I want to look at because listening is very much tied to Paul's command that we not quench the spirit. Now this word quench, I will just confess, I have only heard it used two times or in two ways in my life. The first is on a Gatorade commercial. Gatorade likes to talk about how they can quench your thirst. And the only other time I've heard this word used is with very biblically oriented churchy people. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but if we're thinking about our context as being much more diverse than just having studied scripture, I want to unpack the word quench for a bit. So the word quench, the word in Greek, is used to describe extinguishing something, causing something to go out, suppressing or stifling something. It shows up eight times in our New Testament, and every time it is used to describe a fire, flame, or a lamp being extinguished. This is such a helpful and powerful metaphor as we think about the Holy Spirit at work within our lives. Do I have any campers in the house? 
Oh, there were more campers at our nine o'clock service, I think. All right, we'll see if you all know this. What are the three elements that you need to build a campfire? Spark. Okay, well, Cheryl, you heard the first sermon, but you did know that anyways. A spark or heat? Fuel. And oxygen or air. Yes, thank you. So I, I find that the way that this is helpful to unpack is that we, our lives, are the fuel, that the Holy Spirit is the heat or that spark, and the oxygen is the space around us. You see, I think that we can suffocate and fill so much of what is around us that we, without realizing it, stifle the voice of God in our lives. I think we are most set up to do this in a really unique and terrifying way in our generation. And by generation, I simply mean all of us who are alive at this time together. So they're doing some research about what's happening to us as we continue to let smartphones be integrated into our lives. And one of the things that they're finding is that as soon as people get bored or feel a little bit awkward or they feel slightly out of place, the default mode is to pull out our phones. That seems fairly harmless. It's wonderful to be distracted from feeling awkward or feeling like you need something to do. But what they're finding is that by stopping ourselves from getting bored, that we are preventing our brains from getting to the most creative product or work possible. That in fact, in order for our brains to be at their most creative, you have to go through a period of boredom in order to get some clarity. I think this so speaks to the danger that's also inherent for our spiritual lives. If we're never capable of sitting still, if we must fill every ounce with a conversation or with work or with relationship or with news or with our smartphones or with social media, if we fill every mental space possible, I believe it's possible that we are quenching the voice of God without even realizing it. If there isn't space around us, we might miss how God is at work. We could do a whole separate sermon on some of those disciplines. I will simply say that if that's something that you want to cultivate, I highly encourage you to look up some of the disciplines of solitude, silence, and stillness. There are so many resources available from the past 2,000 years of the church. There are people that we can learn from. So if that's something that you want to cultivate, I encourage you to dig there. But there's also a really intense warning inherent in this verse. Are any of you familiar with Oswald Chambers and his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest? Yes, this devotional has messed me up on more than one occasion. Uh, Of all the things that I've read, and I have read quite a lot, I love reading. There's something about Oswald. His devotionals are so short, and they are so potent. He had a gift for discernment and seeing the truth, and he cuts right to the heart of the matter. And he has a reflection on this verse. And I warn you, it was... It was a heavy thing for me to read. It's from August 13th in his devotional, and he says, Beware if in sharing your personal testimony, you continually have to look back, saying, Once, a number of years ago, I was saved. If you have put your hand to the plow and are walking in the light, there is no looking back. The past is instilled into the present wonder of fellowship and oneness with God. If you get out of the light, you become a sentimental Christian and live only on your memories. Beware of trying to cover up your present refusal to walk in the light by recalling your past experiences when you did walk in the light. This devotional stopped me in my tracks. It is terrifying to me that God allows us to quench his voice. Because implicitly, if Paul is saying, don't quench the spirit, then that means that we have the ability to silence the voice of the living God. 
that means that in the way that we spend our time and our energy and our very lives, that we can so suffocate the voice of the Spirit of God that we can't hear it anymore. And it is more dangerous for us who have an amazing past story to tell. That warning is more true for us because it, at times it can be easier to look backwards than it is to see where God is at work right now. So I encourage us to let these words from Oswald that I believe are inspired by the Spirit to soak in for just a minute this morning. And if it feels to you like it's been a really long time since you saw God at work, if it feels like it's been years since you were sure that the Spirit was leading you somewhere, then I invite you to take that to God in humility and in prayer and say, God, show me. Where was it that I quenched your voice and I didn't know it? Where was it that I said no to you instead of the yes you were looking for? Let God stir up and reinvigorate wherever it is that you find yourself in this moment. Because the beautiful thing about following after Jesus is it's never too late to turn around. The word repent simply means to turn around. And if you have found yourself going in a direction where God is not speaking, then my invitation is for you to turn around. God always, always, always is waiting for us with open arms. I believe God is speaking. And for whatever reason, the living God trusts us to respond with free will and agency to that voice or to squash it. The other thing that theologians seem to agree on about this idea of quenching the Spirit is that at first when you say no to the Spirit, you can tell that you're saying no, you're aware. But each following time you sense the Spirit of God move and you say no, it gets harder and harder and harder to distinguish if that was God at all. Now my prayer for you is that you would take these words from Paul seriously don't quench or stifle or suffocate the Holy Spirit whenever you have the opportunity. Stay open to the voice of God. The next question I get asked most often when talking about what it means to listen to the voice of God is, how do you know if it's God? How do you know if it's the Spirit? How do you know if it's you? And discerning and being able to tell what is God and what is not God is definitely something that is cultivated over time. So I don't want you to be discouraged if you feel like the first time you sit down and try to be open to the Spirit in a fresh way that it doesn't happen right away because it is cultivated over time. But I think this verse gives us the tools that we need to know what to do Paul says, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. Prophecy simply is the words of God for the people of God. So when you're trying to tell if a word is from God or not, test it, measure it, hold it up against different things to see what it is made of. And we test what is of God and what is not by seeing what is good and what is evil. And the next question is, how do we know what is good and what is evil? We all have different and arguing descriptions of what those things are. And once again, Scripture is a wealth of information and a resource for us because Scripture tells us what is good and what is evil. In these verses, right before the ones for today, Paul says, live in peace with each other, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other. Right here, we have several clues about what is good. If it is increasing peace, not a false sense of agreement, but the deep kind of shalom that scripture talks about. Is it, is it leading you to encourage those who are discouraged, helping those who need help, being patient with everyone? Can you just imagine how our communities would be transformed if every person who claimed to follow Jesus strove to do what is good for each other? That is transformative. We have all of the tools that we need before us. Galatians 5 is another helpful passage if you want to know what is of the Spirit and what is not. 
In Galatians 5, we're told that the fruit of spirit, the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you're not sure if you're hearing the voice of God, hold it up against these things. The fruit of the spirit will never lie. Where the spirit of the living God is, these things will be present. And the reverse is also true, that scripture lets us know what is evil. And it might not be as obvious as some of us would like to think. According to 1 Kings 14, 9, the people are described as having done evil. And what they did that was evil was they made other gods, they worshiped idols, and they turned their back on God. 1 Samuel 15, 23 describes evil as rebellion, arrogance, idolatry, and again, rejecting the word of God. Mark 7 describes evil thoughts by just saying that they involve lust and theft and murder and adultery, but also greed and deceit and envy and slander and arrogance. And Romans 7 describes evil as being self-seeking and rejecting the truth. This was a humbling point for me to study because like I think most of us do, we tend to think as evil as being this very obvious, terrible thing. Like violence in your face is evil or someone extremely cruel and rude to another person, that's evil. But if we read that list, if I read this list, there are days when I participate with evil more than I participate with good. There are days when I quench the voice of the Holy Spirit and I choose to be greedy and selfish and prone to anger. See, when we don't realize what's at stake, when we think of evil as only those huge extreme things that those people out there do, and when we don't recognize our own capacity for evil, it ends up taking us to a path that we didn't necessarily think that we would go. What if we as the people of God held up every decision that we have to make and really measure it, really test it to see what is good, where the Spirit's leading us, and what is evil, which means being led away from God's plans for our lives. I believe that it makes all the difference in the world when we take seriously God's word and the resource that it is for our lives. But I must warn you, if you take these words seriously, if you pray continually, if you commit to stay open to the Spirit, and if you test everything by holding on to what is good and, what is, and rejecting what is evil, you will end up in different places than you otherwise would have expected to be. I will confess that if it were not for these verses, I would not be planning a drive out of Houston in two weeks. I would not be leaving the city that I love, this place where God has shown me who I am. I love this community, and I intended to stay planted in this city for several more years. But it was in taking seriously these words from God that if I really want to stay open to the Holy Spirit, then when I sense a call, then the answer is yes, even if there's a wrestle first. And let me be honest, there's always a wrestle first. I'm very stubborn. When I first started sensing a call into a more focused expression of ministry, my plan was to stay or put and to work part-time and go to school part-time. This was the plan that I was setting up. And it wasn't until I took time for spiritual renewal in January where I started to sense that God was going to ask me to take a bigger risk. I will also confess that I would not be taking this journey had my husband not really encouraged me to look more, more broadly at what God might be doing. That I am a play it safe kind of person. I want to know exactly how every step is related to the next. And I was very committed when I graduated the last time that I never wanted to go back to grad school. <laughs> and here we are. If you take seriously these verses, you will end up in a different place than you expect at times. But there is no other route to the abundant life that God has for every single one of us and for us as a community. This is the only way to be walking faithfully and fruitfully, 
with God in step. And this is a hard reality, if we're honest. It can be difficult. But I believe that God gives us every good tool we need to submit to him. And I believe that God gives us everything we need to be able to be faithful. My final charge for you, church family, is that you would pray continually, that you would become prayers, that prayer would saturate everything you do, that you would not quench the spirit, that you would stay open to the voice of God no matter how uncomfortable or challenging that is at certain times, and that you would cling to what is good, always rejecting what is evil. And borrowing Paul's words from verses 23 and 24, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Let's pray. Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know no matter where you are or how you worship with us, you are always part of our church family. We would love to have you join us live downtown at 845 or 11 o'clock, or as always, through the broadcast. We would love to hear from you. If you have a question about today's service, if you would like to contact one of our pastors, if we can pray for you in any way, please reach out to us through our church website. Thanks for worshiping with us today. It was great to have you with us. 